such great singing. Worship, thank you for leading us into the Holy of Holies. And I, I well, we had a lady just get the Holy Ghost. There's nothing wrong with that. How you like that? Doing worship, people getting the Holy Ghost. I want to thank you for coming. It's very evident that many made an effort to be here this morning. And I am thrilled that you are here. And I feel like that the Lord will speak to us before we've done. And uh, I, I don't think he will. I know he will. I want to say to Pastor Gentry, your last two messages have just simply been fabulous. And Pastor Andrew, your message last Sunday was a masterpiece, and I thank you for it. Pastor Ryan, your teaching on Wednesday night, it was just a great lesson on love. And I thank God for the team that he has given us. Also, this is Black History Month. I give honor to all of the blacks in our congregation that worship with us. <clears throat> I went out to Dad's grave Friday and I thanked him for building such a strong foundation in this church. He built a strong foundation a new group of people in 1950 set out to follow him. And he had 60-something people, 35 people vote on him. And here we stand today in this magnificent place. And I do give honor to my mother, such a great woman of God. So I went out, and whether it's soul sleeping, I mean, we, we got debate in his own congregation that, I'm sure Dr. Brewer, the Southern Baptist, debate it. They're like us. They debate about everything. And we're the same way. But whether your soul sleep or whether you're awake or whatever, but if, if Dad's awake, I promise you, he's in the service this morning. And Sister Tinny, I went to my <clears throat> place where I keep my handkerchief, and I keep this one separate because it's the one that you gave me that Brother Tinny anointed for me with his initials on it. So I don't bring it with me often, but I'm going to preach with it today. Genesis 19 and 12. And the men said unto Lot, how's there any besides? Question. Son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city. Did you read that? Bring them out of this place. Jesus warned in Luke 17, 28 and 30, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. If it is proper to do so, would you grab the person's hand beside you? If not, raise your hands and let's ask God's anointing to rest on all of us this morning. Would you just lift your voice really loud and cry out to God that intercede for me right now. If you would do that. In the name of Jesus. Would you finish that off now with a clap of praise to him for he is worthy. God bless you, you may be seated. To our elected officials and all of you that are here that Pastor Gentry has already given honor to you, I, I do give honor to you. 
These two texts reading this morning should be enough to tell us that we are living uh, in prophecy fulfilling times with God's people crying out, even so, come Lord Jesus. When you read Isaiah 21 and 11, it says, the burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Isaiah 21, 12. And the watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye and return and come. As bishop of the church and pastor of the pastor, I will do as Joel 2 and 1 has declared me to do. This morning I will blow the trumpet in the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the world tremble for the day of the Lord cometh and it is nigh at hand. Once again, it has been confirmed to me by the Holy Ghost that as often as I preach, I need to preach often that there is nothing like the coming of the Lord. And I need to remind myself and to keep the pastor, the man that I pastor, your pastor, reminded of the fact that Timothy wrote in 1 and 7, 3, 1 through 7, that this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous, they'll be boasters, they'll be proud, they'll be blasphemers, they'll be disobedient to parent, they'll be unthankful, they'll be unholy without natural affection. They'll be truce breakers, they'll be false accusers, they'll be incontinent, they'll be fierce, they'll be despisers of those that are good, they'll be traitors, they'll be heady, they'll be high-minders, they'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. He said, from such turn away. For of the sort are they which creep into the houses, led captive, silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. My subject this morning is a command from the Lord. It is the last statement of the scripture that I open with, bring your family out of this place. So today I will lift my voice like a trumpet. I will sound the alarm. I will tell you that the rapture of the church could be fulfilled any moment. The rapture could happen in the twinkling of an eye, a thief in the night. The Lord shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So bring your family out of this place. After, everybody say after. Now we're talking about after the rapture. After the rapture takes place, Jesus gives us a warning of a great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this very time. And no, he said, shall there ever be. He said it's gonna be so bad that if those days were not shortened, there should be no flesh that would, that would even be saved. Bring your family out of this place. Not only now are we seeing the signs of the coming of the Lord with the wars and the rumors of wars, there's now earthquakes, and that used to not really bother me. It's always bothered me because I knew it was part of the signs of the time, but the other day, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had an earthquake in Louisiana. How many knew we had an earthquake in Louisiana? We did. So I also saw a thing pop up on my screen. It said, Texas had 30 earthquakes today. I said, what? Texas had 30 earthquakes. So I Googled it. So not right now, but when you get home this afternoon, Google earthquakes in Texas. And this is what I did Friday at 3.12 p.m. I Googled earthquake, earthquakes in Texas. Texas at that time had had 22 earthquakes in the last 24 hours. They had 157 in the past seven days. They had 563 in the last 30 days, and they've had 4,465 earthquakes in the last 360 days that were greater than M1.5, whatever that measures. So earthquakes and natural disasters and fires and floods and tornadoes and riots and drug abuse and alcohol and racial unrest and culture wars and crime and religious apostasy and immorality as it was in the days of Lot defies any description that we've ever been in in my lifetime. Sodom is mentioned 10 times in the scripture and in every case, the name is synonymous with sexual perversion. 
The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly, the Bible said. There was a Harvard historian by the name of David Landers, and I quote him. He said, culture makes all the difference. Why some civilizations rise and others fail, not natural resources, but it's geography. He said, central to America's rise to global leadership is our Judo-Christian tradition. And then he names other things. He said, but he closes his conclusion by saying, but at the foundation is the preeminence of the family. He said, culture matters. The serious-minded person with his eyes open in this day and time understands that the home life of our land is being terribly imperiled and undermined. I will say this morning to whoever and whatsoever that strikes against the home life of the people and the enduring institution of marriage. And by marriage, I mean a relationship between one man and one woman. And that one man is what they were at birth, and that one woman is what they were at birth. It strikes at the very heart of God, the very foundation of a worthy and stable civilization. I don't need to do a Bible study on all of that. Even nature itself teaches. C.S. Lewis, a great author, wrote, the home is the ultimate career, and all other careers exist for one purpose, and that is to support the ultimate career, and the ultimate career that you have in your life is your home. This holy book, this book of books, the God-breathed book, the inspired, infallible, inerrant, eternal word of God tells me in Psalm 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. He wrote in Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. He wrote in Psalm 9 and 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell in all nations that forget God. Let me be very clear to this congregation. Hear your bishop this morning as I preach, or if you're a guest, hear your guest evangelist. The laws of God are immutable. The laws of God cannot be broken. The laws of God can be defied, but the laws of God cannot be broken. He has a law called the law of gravity. Let me promise you something. If you go to New York or if you go to the, a bridge, if you go anywhere and you jump off of the Empire State Building, let me promise you, you're going down. You can defy that law. You can say, I'm going to float out here and float over the next building, take the escalator down and go home. You can, def you can defy the law, but you cannot break the law. And when we get to Romans chapter 1, God's wrath, towards ungodliness is there. He said, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They professed themselves to be wise, but they became fools. They changed the truth of God into a lie. And they worship and they serve the creature more than they did the creator. And likewise also the men leaving the natural affection of the woman burned in their lust one for another. Men with men working which is unseemly and proper and seemly behavior and receiving in themselves that recompense payment of their era which was meet, meaning which was fitting. And here is the frightening part. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. We need to understand today that God is a God of mercy and God is a God of grace, but God is also a God of judgment. And we won't hear a lot of that preached, not in the Pentecostal churches, not in other denominations. You won't hear a lot of judgment being preached today. But I'm going to be a little different, and I'm going to take you, before I preach some things, I'm going to take you to help me and you to understand this. When you get through with Romans chapter 1, what's the next chapter? Oh, you're so smart, mother. <laughs> chapter 2. 
So let me show you, we had this one chapter done. Don't quit reading Romans, open chapter two, because I have never really understood this and I hope it enlightens your eyes. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, that whatsoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doth the same thing. Let me say this. We can preach against sin. We can preach against sin hard. We can preach against perversion. But when we get through preaching against all of that, you got to understand that person, that man, that woman that's bound in that particular sin, they have a soul that needs to be saved from a lake of fire. And as bad as I hate their sin, and as bad as I despise transgender, and everything, as bad as I despise it, that man, that woman has a soul that I want to see saved. And that is some mother's darling. And if that was your baby, you would want somebody praying for it. If that was my baby, I would want somebody praying for it. Judge the sin, but don't judge them. Let God do that. Why, this man that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ, his name was Solomon. He said in Proverbs 19 and 10, he said, the fear of the Lord. Would you say the fear of the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about him there with such sledgehammer getting ready to wipe you out. I could almost replace fear there with love. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. If you want wisdom, you will fear God. Or let me say, if you want wisdom, you will love God. Ecclesiastes, though Solomon writes again in 12, 13, and 14, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What, what? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's a healthy fear. It's not a wipe you out fear. It's a God, I love you so much. God, I love your commandments so much that I want to show you how I love you by doing my best to keep your commandments. When Paul went to Felix and he was standing before him, the Bible says in Acts 24, 24 and 25, he said, and after certain days when Felix came and his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he responded of righteousness, temperance and... Look what Paul preached to Felix. He preached righteousness. He preached temperance and love, but then he also preached judgment to come. Felix trembled and he shook and he answered, go thy way at time when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. He reasoned with him over righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. When Jesus warned us in Luke 17, 28 and 30, he said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Our text reading has to do with the highest welfare of those who are bound to us affectionately in this life. The commitments that are closer to me than anything else, most of them sit here, minus Jeff, Michael, and Eva. I am committed to my family. Mick, you're something else. This church loves you, and I give you great honor. This bionic woman, I put her on a plane Tuesday. She flew all night, got to Alaska at 5 a.m. Wednesday morning. She spoke Thursday morning and Friday morning, went to church Thursday night and Friday night, caught a plane yesterday morning. I picked her up at 10.30 last night because she wanted to be in this service with us this morning. Mickey, Michael, and, and Gentry and their families are blessed to have you and this church was blessed to have you as a first lady. So, Jeff, Michael, Eva, Gibson, Gentry, Lex, Isabel, and Gad, y'all are my top priority. When I came here 43 years ago, and you elected me your pastor, I pledged to you that I would serve you. And I've done my best to bury your dead, dedicate your children, love you, be there when you needed me, be there for your family. And likewise, it's a two-way street. Not only have I been loyal to you, You've been very loyal to me and my family, and I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. I enjoyed shepherding you for those 43 years. It was just a great trip. I'm glad pastor's got it now. 
and please pray for him. Mickey and I this May will celebrate 52 years of marriage and she's been right by my side and I love her more than life. But I'm gonna stay in this book of books. It's the eternal word. I will live at this altar. I will be like Abraham. I'm gonna stay at the altar that I built years ago that my daddy taught me how to pray the tabernacle plan because there are three or four different pieces of furniture in the tabernacle where I call my family's name individually every morning when I pray. This altar, Mickey, where'd you get this altar? You got it at an antique place or somewhere. Oh, it came from Aunt Nona, mother. It's a hand-me-down from the Gibsons. Well, that's great. So I, I, Curtis was bringing this out. They were helping me set all this up. He said, uh, he said, Bishop, do you want me to put a pad down there? I said, Curtis, have you ever heard of a padded altar? <laughs> this altar where I took everything. Where you go? Build an altar. It's that altar that's everything. Mother Song says, I'm going to build an altar in my life because time is short and the fast of this world passeth away. And look at me. My family is going to heaven with me. And you know what? Your family is going to heaven with you. I don't care what it looks like now. I don't care. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Your family is going to heaven with you. Just get your altar ready. Get on your knees. And we're going to pray them through and out of everything. Our family is going to heaven with us. If you believe that, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph and claim your promise. But they had to do in that Old Testament. They put that blood on that doorpost and that death angel saw it. If my house were on fire, what would I do? If my house was on fire and they were in it. If my house was on fire. I remember when I was, well, I'm still chaplain, but I'm not an active chaplain with the police force. Lawrence, back when Lauren, uh, uh, the candidate that's running, back when he was a policeman, I rode with him. And there was a house on fire. i never forget that he had kids. His father was out and he had kids and the house was burned. They were already dead. But I'll never forget us having to literally handcuff that man and put him in the back seat of the car. He's still trying to get in that burning house. I can relate to that a little bit. It wasn't a burning house, but it was July the 1st, 1990. Now, folks, this is a perfect storm. Understand, it's the first day of camp meeting. We got five to 6,000 Pentecostals at the campground. And I decided to take Brother Lumpkin, and Gentry was five, and Mike L was skiing. She was on the back. I think she was 14, and I was getting ready to pull her up, and she was going to slalom, and we would take off. Brother Lumpkin was in. At that time, you didn't have to have a life jacket on. He couldn't swim. He was in the boat. Trey was in the boat. Gentry was in the boat. And I floorboarded that boat, and when I did, the back end of the boat blew up. And I'm instantly, half of the boat was on fire, and the life jackets were in the back. I go back in that fire and I grab one that's on fire, I dip it in the water, and Brother Lumpkin standing there just frozen, crying, shaking. He couldn't swim, and he wouldn't put the life jacket on. So finally, I did what I'd been wanting to do for a long time. I slapped the fire out of him. <laughs> I just reared by. I said, "Pop!" And I slapped him. He said, "What?" I said, "Put this life jacket on." And I put that life jacket on him, and, and <laughs> I threw him overboard, and I threw Gentry overboard, and. And I didn't have any life jacket. And I was out in the middle of Butte Lake. Thank God there was a boat at the other end. And I told him, I said, Gentry, stay away from Paul Paul. He was fighting the water. And I was telling Mike, he'll do everything to help Gentry. And I, I was swimming. And when I got to shore, I'd had on sweats. I'd taken them off and I had on jams. Well, when I got to the shore, the town talk was there. <laughs> and they got a picture of me coming out of that water in my jams. And I had on a T-shirt. Nothing wrong with that. Only it was a Hard Rock Cafe t-shirt. <laughs> so the Pentecostals get me for the jams and the Baptists get me for the Hard Rock Cafe t-shirt. <laughs> Can't defy the law. The men God used to warn Lot of the impending doom said to Lot, hast thou anybody else? Do you have anybody else in this house, any of your daughters, any of your son, anyone there? 
That whole city of Sodom was plunging to doom and destruction and because of such doom was the collapse of morality and righteousness in that city and the whole world. Yes, I am concerned about the economy. Yes, I'm concerned about jobs. Yes, I'm concerned about health reforms. And yes, I'm concerned about taxes because April 15th is coming. Yes, I'm concerned about the national debt. But what are all these things in a moment when you compare with a moral, spiritual collapse of a nation? This woke generation has woke us about as far as we can woke. And then they say, we're coming after your children over our dead bodies. We'll fight you in the streets. We'll fight you on the levee. We'll fight you in the wars. We'll fight you everywhere. You're not getting our babies. We'll fight you everywhere. You're not getting our babies. You're not going to change the sex of my grandbaby. You're not going to change that thing. You're not going to mess with my baby. We'll fight you everywhere we can fight you. We'll fight you. We're going to stand for the things of God and the purpose of God. We're going to stand for Take your socialism on down the road. We don't want that. We want a way that walks after God. We want a holy way. We want a godly way. We want to walk away that this Bible says no vulture eyes ever even seen it. It's a holy, godly path that we want to walk and give our hearts and our lives and our families to God. I, I got a rude awakening because, you know, we've been pretty hard on Sodom. And uh, we've been pretty hard on uh, the perversion that is always linked to Sodom. And I started studying, I'm sure Dr. Brewer's already seen it, but Ezekiel 16, 49, and 50, I've never preached, and it got all over me this week because we're all in Sodom. Oh, I don't think that, yep, 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 we're, we're, we're all. If we're not there, we're just coming out of it. Ezekiel 16, 49, and 50, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, hmm. fullness of bread, hmm. abundant of idleness was in her and her daughters. Hmm. She wouldn't help the poor. Oh, that, that Sodomite. Mm -hmm. And the needy. They were haughty and they committed abomination. So when you think of Sodom, just don't let your mind go to perversion. Let it go to they wouldn't take care of the poor. They wouldn't feed the hungry. They were idleness. They only cared about themselves. And they got into their own way of living. And God said, you know what I did? I took them away in other ways. God's patience was exhausted and I removed them. But, and not much longer, but listen. Because of Abraham. Would everybody say Abraham? Abraham. And his intercessory prayer. Never have I preached, never have I heard my father preach what I'm getting ready to preach. It shook me. Abraham negotiated with God from 50 down to finally, can I find 10 righteous souls? God comes all the way down with him. Yes. You find 10? Yes. I will spare the people. And he couldn't find 10. So then we get to Genesis 18, 33, the scripture that shook me to my foundation. And the Lord went his way as soon as he left communing with Abraham. Do you get the picture? God, would you spare 10? No. And all of a sudden, God says, See ya, Abraham, great talking with you. And the Bible says that God walks away. So long, great talking with you. See ya, Abe. <laughs> Abraham said, oh, 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 you're not gonna get by that easy, God. Mm -mm. You got some promises that you're bound to. Yeah. Yep, you walked away, but I'm walking too. Yeah. And I'm going back to my altar. And I'm kneeling down at my altar. And the Bible says that Abraham went back to his altar. And God heard his prayer. And God answered his prayer. 
Abraham went to his place of intercession and look at 1927 of Genesis. And Abraham got up early. He kept going there. In the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, he went to where you've left me, you've walked off, but I'm going to keep standing I'll be in that prayer room every morning. I'll be wherever I got to go. I'll be in my prayer closet, but I'm going to keep standing before you. You may have walked away. You may not have answered my prayer that I've been praying for, but I will stay at this altar till I get my answer. My family's going to be saved. My family's going to be delivered. My family's going to be set free. I am not leaving my altar. I'm going to get my family out of here. Abraham, God's earthly partner. He had cut a blood covenant with Abraham. He had a blood covenant with Abraham. And the Bible says because of Abraham's blood covenant. Well, let me tell you something. We cut a blood covenant with God when our hearts were circumcised and he threw the foreskin of our heart away. That blood was shed and now we're under a blood covenant with Jesus Christ. And the Lord doesn't have to do it because of me, but he has to do it because it's in his book. He cannot break the law of his own book. He is bound by his word. He has to do it. He has to do it. He has to do it. Train up a child in which you go to my kids. Are, he has to do it. Your babies are going to be saved. He has to do it. He's bound to this book. Your babies are going to be saved. Just stay at the altar. Because the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and the heavens are going to stay at the altar and the heavens with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and also the works therein, and everything's going to be burned up. Everything we put value on, your houses, your cars, your boats, your clothes, your furniture, your things, your bank accounts, your stocks, your bonds, your businesses, everything you spend your life building, everything that your naked eye can see, all the works, everything is going to be burned up. Don't let things possess you. They are just things. And when you get the next thing, it will only satisfy for a while. When your life is built on getting things, it will only satisfy for a while. You'll get that thing, you'll want the next thing, then you'll want the next thing, and then you'll want the next thing. Things, 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 things doesn't satisfy. There's only one thing that's satisfying, and that's getting to the altar and getting your family out of this place. Paul tells Timothy, I want you to look on this screen. He said, charge them. He didn't say tell them or ask them. He said, charge them that are rich in this world that they are not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. He didn't tell them not to be rich. In fact, I hope all of you become millionaires. That's what we're going to pray for. But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to what? God wants us to enjoy things in this life. Don't get this message wrong. He wants you to enjoy things. He wants you to go hunting. He wants you to go fishing. He wants you to, ladies to go shopping without my credit card. He wants you to... <laughs> he wants you to, whatever thing you enjoy, whatever's your thing, he wants you to enjoy that as long as it's godly. He's not, he's not wanting us to be a bunch of hermits that are just walking around going to heaven. He wants us to get out and enjoy things, stay spiritual, make sure it's spiritual. But he wants us to enjoy our family. He wants us to go on trips together. He wants us to go to the mountains together. He wants us to go snow skiing together. Not me anymore, but he wants us to all go enjoy ourselves. God giveth us all these things to enjoy. Enjoy it. Enjoy things. God's given it to you. I hope he blesses you that you can get more things if it doesn't damn your soul. Because Abraham, everybody say Abraham, was a rich man. Well, these people's got riches. You better thank God for anybody in this church that got money. They help us support the kingdom of God. <laughs> Abraham was a rich man. Yes, he did. He had land, he had cattle, he had livestock. But the patriarchs of that day <laughs> were sin belies by two things. A tent and an altar. They could not let realities and things blind their eyes that they were pilgrims and strangers. 
just passing through this life. First Peter 2, 9, 11. You're a chosen generation, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, you're a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who's called you out of darkness into this marvel of lights which in time past were not people but are now the people of God which had not attained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Watch, dearly beloved. I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you as strangers and pilgrims estranged from Leslie flesh which war against the soul. My goal is eternity with Christ. We used to sing a song here years ago. I want a mansion just over the hilltop. That's just the craziest song I ever heard. In fact, there is no place in Scripture where you're promised a mansion of any kind. Oh, you don't know your Bible. John 14 and 2 said, in my Father's house are many mansions. He did. But he didn't say none of them were yours. In fact, I got a scary revelation on it. Notice what he says next. I go to prepare a place for you. Those mansions, he said, There are mansions already in heaven, but I think I got something better than a mansion for you. He said, those mansions already in heaven, but what I'm preparing for you is greater than anything you can. There's no mansion can compare with it. I got something prepared for you that's better than any mansion. Oh, that's really got some of you scholars' mind rolling right there. They were in search of a promised land. Hebrews 11, 13, 14. These all died in the faith, not having received their promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded in them and embraced them and confessed. They confessed, I'm just a stranger and pilgrim in this earth. For they that say such things declare plainly, I'm seeking a country. I'm not looking for some villa. I love our place in Colorado, and that's it. And I love POA, and I love our family life center. Used to have everything over there, racquetball. Used to have bowling. We couldn't keep it fixed, so we had to tear that thing down. But now we got, what is it, picket pickleball or something? And then you can go over there, and you can racquetball, pickleball. We, we, we got all those things, but it's just things and things and things. that you got to understand Abraham stayed in a tent because he understood he was just a stranger. And when God said move, he moved. And when God said go, he said go. He never built a house. He never wanted brick and mortar. He never wanted that because he knew that was all going to pass away. Yes, I'm for storing up money for your family. Yes, I'm for you making all the money you can make. Yes, I'm for you leaving savings for your family. Yes, I'm for all those things, but not at the expense of losing your soul. My old dad would sing the song all the way back 16th and Day Street. I was five, six, seven years old, 56, 57, 58. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The heavens beckoned me from heaven's open door. And I came feel at home. Don't seek permanency. Don't be over down here. Make a good living. See what you can do to turn a dollar. Do everything you can, not at the expense of losing yourself. I'm for all of that. It blesses the kingdom of God. But understand, it's a tent that you got to live in. It's a tent mindset that you got to keep. None of this is permanent. I've said it a million times at funerals. I'm going to say it a million and one. I've never seen a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse. You can't take anything with you naked. You came in this world naked. You're going to leave. Well, I'll leave some for my kids. Be careful because a full cup of coffee is hard to handle. Just make sure it's well taken care of. But then the next thing he had in his life was an altar. And he built that altar, and he had a relationship with God. And Lot was a man that didn't live for an altar. He never built an altar. He never got weaned from Sodom. He loved, Lot loved Sodom. Everybody say, Lot loved Sodom. But because he had an uncle, and I'm about done, 
because Abraham or Lot had an uncle that built altars and knew how to intercede in prayer, stand in the gap. He hastened an angel to Sodom. Let me paraphrase it for you in our language. This is KJV, this is G-A-M. The angel said, my hands are tied because of your uncle Abraham's prayers. He's a man of the altar. I can't do a thing until I get you out of here, Lot. He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but I can't get you out. I can't, he can't do that until I get you out because of that prayer warrior, Abraham. And yet it says, what? What? And yet it says, Lot still lingered. Get my family out of Sodom. You're bound to your word. So the angelic messenger laid hold on the hands with Lot not wanting to go. And he got wife hand and he got the kids hand. And supernaturally, he drug Lot out of Sodom. And when they got out, it rained fire and brimstone. Last Saturday, we dedicated 10 babies. Our pastor preached an unbelievable message and he ended with a scripture that I asked him, I told him I was going to use because it was, it was revelation. And it's exactly what I'm preaching. You'll see. I said, look, Jens, it's already in my notes. Matthew 18 and 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven. What is that? That in heaven. I'm sorry, Matthew 18 and 10. Is, is that there? Okay. Let's read together. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, that, that wh wh whose angels? Wh whose angel? Their angel. Their, their angel. Every one of my family, every one of you and your family has an angel. Now, I don't pray to the angel. I pray to Jesus. And I say, Jesus, it's your angels. You send them. So I, you know what I did? I've been interceding, praying. I mean, this message has been on me. I've been interceding, and I've got my mind made up. I pray, Jeff, I pray for you every morning. You got your angel, and you and Michael and Eva and Gib, y'all coming out. Gentry, Lex, Isabel, Gad, y'all coming out. Mick, you're coming out. I've been praying for your angel. And I said, send Jeff's angel to get him. Send Michael's angel to get her. Send Eva's angel to get her. Send Gibson's angel to get him. Send Gentry to get his. Send Lex to get hers. Send Isabel's to get hers. Send Gad to get his. And God, while you're at it, send about 20 to get my mother. <laughs> but my family... Got a name on it. Megan, Terry, I went out to my dad's grave. I told you, and I walked over to Brother Lumpkins, and I went over to your daddy's. I, I walked back, looked like a brand new one, and still fresh on your heart. He, Steve, his picture was so pretty. But I'm getting a hold of my family. Oh, I don't know, Mother. It's going to take more than me to get you out of here. I want to go. I'm going. I'm going. Where's Gibson? My angel's watching over me. You know what? Yeah. They don't want to go. They're going anyway. They're going. You say you believe that? I'm going to have them drug out. That, that record service around here says, we'll take you push, pull, or drag. They're going to get drug out. All my family's on drugs. They're going to get drug out of this world. They're going to heaven. My babies are going to heaven. Mother, you're the one who really needs to be leading the way. I'm going to tell you. I know you believe it. All that, even 20 angels part, you believe that. I'm dragging my family out. My, my family's going to heaven. I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm dragging my family out. You're coming out. Jason, that whole crew up there, they're coming out, buddy. Your kids are coming out. Your kids are coming out. Get on your feet. Your kids are coming out. 
Your kids are coming out. Drag them, pull them, wherever they are. Get a hold of them. Your kids are coming out. Your family's coming out. Your family leaving this place. Here's what I want you to do to your family, to our single folks that are here. You don't have family. I would love for you to come on the platform with me if you would like to join me. If not, you've got family around your dad or mother, whoever the priest of your home. Would you put your arms, don't anybody move ushers, close the doors and lock them. Put a bow on it. I don't want anybody leaving yet, please. Because God is getting ready to do a work. Put your arms around your family. Pull them close, and whoever is the lead in that home, would you lift your voice and begin to pray over your family right now? Come on, pull them out. I hope I preach it where you want to. Pull them out. That's it. That's the voice of an intercessor. Pull your family out, Jimmy. Get them out of this land. Get them out. That's it. Someone come to the altar. Come on. Get your family out. Pull your family out of this place. Pull your family out of this place. My baby's going. His companion's going. Her companion's going. My son-in-law, my daughter-in-law, I don't have any yet. Your grandkids, your future grandkids, they're going to heaven. Claim them right now. Speak into the future. Pull them out of this world. Pull them out of this place. We're just pilgrim and strangers. Passing through. Still nobody walk out. If you'd like to come forward, people are coming forward. Come on, if you'd like to make a move, come on the front of the church. I said step forward if you'd like to. I'm not done, so don't leave. Don't leave yet. That's it, bring your families. 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 Bring your families. Plead the blood over your family. Plead the blood over your family. Plead the blood over your family. Now, could I have your attention just a moment? Could I have your attention just a moment? Listen, come on, keep coming to the altar. We got time, come on, keep coming. But listen to Bishop just a moment. Brother Joel Lawler was promoted a few weeks ago and oh, what a great singer he was. And he sung a song, it's six minutes long, I'm gonna cut it short. Don't want to, but I'm going to for the sake of time. But it's where we're going and I want you to listen to the words carefully. Now I'm 
heaven and I'm taking my family with me my family's going to heaven with me my kids are going to heaven with me push pull a drag I'm going to heaven my kids are going to heaven if you're in this room you have not been baptized in Jesus name today's your day to be baptized in Jesus name Thank you on the balcony. Thank you for everybody and nobody left. Thank you so very much. Would you, with a hand clap of praise, help me give thanks to God for what he's done. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I love you great people. Go up there and get baptized in Jesus' name. Some of you need it again if you need to go up there. I love you. to our online community, our church family. It's been an honor to have you on this Sunday. Thank you for being with us. What an incredible day that we have had here at the POA, and I know that you have felt that in your homes, at work, maybe you're in your car, wherever you may be. We know that you have felt the presence of God. What a message we have heard. Whatever we've got to do, let's get our families out of this world. Let's build ourselves an altar. If you've never given Jesus the opportunity in your life to repent of your sins, be baptized in his name, to be filled with his spirit, we encourage you to do so. We want to get out of this old world and make it to our home, heaven. Thank you for being with us. Glad to have you. We'll see you Wednesday night at 7. Next Sunday at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a great day in the name of the Lord. Bring your family out in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.